portion. Um, so this has proven successful and we wanted to keep this going, despite the fact that even our local hospitals and doctors have um, lifted all the mask restrictions. It's really convenient, I know, for you all who are as busy as the spring market is bearing to just hop on a quick virtual and gather some information and then go on. And that's certainly the purpose of today's um, discussion and program. So let me introduce um, my friend and my colleague um, and really a, a, one of my partners in projects that we're working on, um, Chris Saxman. And Chris is um, originally Pennsylvania. He was born in Pittsburgh. I don't know if we have any Steelers fans, but just to put that out there as a mark, he was born in Pittsburgh, but grew up Stanton, Augusta area of Lexington. He went to Washington and Lee and um, studied and, and graduated and graduated. And Thank you. That part. Graduated. It was close. Look, it was close. <laughs> <Be honest. laughs> hey, um, just kidding. You don't have to tell me that. Um, so he he now lives in Richmond, darling sweet wife Michelle, who <clears throat> knows that I call her my muse. I just love Michelle Sachs. And they are the proud parents of ranging in ages from 29 down to the in-law, a Marine. Simplify on that one, Chris. You know that. And they also have a brand new daughter-in-law. So Team Saxman is growing. I can't wait for more of that regard at some point in the near future. But for Chris's day-to-day, -day, um, he may not be a stranger to any of you because as he puts out his forecast and his election acumen widely sought now, he's getting ready to you. He was in Pennsylvania the election with Senator Fetterman, who ran again, um, then challenger Dr. Oz. I mean, Chris is really sort of our forecaster extraordinaire. Media outlets and others seek his counsel. But his day job is the executive director of the Virginia Commission for Research and Economic Education. And I know that's a mouthful. It's typically called Virginia. And for this call, it's very relevant to you because Virginia Association of Realtors, VAR members of Virginia Free. Because there simply was a feeling people don't financial acumen, they don't understand they don't understand the role of economics in Virginia policy. Chris leads that organization. As a member myself, I can tell you leads it well. So with Chris being with us today, calendar, but we in November, I thought for a number of around several topics and decided off with his first look at what happened in 2023 with the election. A whole host of topics around that to unpack. So I'm going to turn my partner and my very good friend, um, former member of the House of Delegates. So he brings to all of this. So Chris, it's all yours. I'll help you moderate. And let's hold on folks and make sure that you're me, you're driving or in a place where there's a lot of background movement Go off camera so we don't have distractions. There it is. All yours, Chris. Well, thanks, Susan. It's always been a pleasure to work with you and the realtors uh, across the Commonwealth. Um, having served in the Virginia House of Delegates for eight years, one of my uh, subcommittees that I served on was the Realtors, uh, or the Real Estate Subcommittee of General Laws. I forget what the name of the subcommittee was, but it was Terry Suit ran it, and uh, I didn't pay too much attention in there. I just uh, looked down the aisle, looked down the table, and whatever Terry said to do, we pretty much did. <laughs> I think that still happens. <laughs> it's best just to listen to the women go find whatever, just do it, you know, just <laughs> get on with life. But then in my day job, I do analyze uh, Virginia elections and have for the last ooh, nine years, try to communicate to the business community what they need to know so that they constructively uh, engage with their legislature and their legislators, uh, staff, at both at the federal and state levels, 
it's uh, taken to me some interesting twists and turns throughout the years, but uh, this is probably the year of the, the biggest twists and the biggest turns, and it is significantly important to your business and your future. I'm going to let that one soak in a little bit as an emphasis. If I were to type that, that would be bold with italics. This is a big one. Um, I put on there, I put in the uh, chat my Substack, which you can uh, sign up for free. It's a newsletter I put out once a, once a week. And then I have uh, a paid version for people who want you know, deeper analysis or you know, extra election nerd updates. Uh, there's a lot of election nerds in Virginia because we're election nerd Disneyland. We hey, do you would add the okay, cool. You, you keep breaking. I don't know if it's me or you, but you keep breaking up. Um, um, at any rate, I, um, I do the analysis and put it out there because Virginia has an election of consequence every year. The cycle goes president, governor, uh, house, and senate, and then back to um, the governor, the uh, presidential. It's there's there's no there are no off days in Virginia politics. I'll let that sink in, bald and italics. Okay, there are no off days. It's exhausting. It's interminable. But that's our place in history. We're the crucible of Republican form of democracy. It, it is what it is. And as a result, people pay attention to what's going on electorally in Virginia. And because of our proximity to the federal government, it gets more attention than otherwise. We're not Wyoming. No, no aspersions being cast on Wyoming. We are Virginia. So the changes that are coming up this year are going to be significant, and they'll show the direction of both political parties uh, and our bellwether status will be um, re <laughs> reconfirmed. Right now, there are 26 announced retirements in the House and the Senate. 10 in the Senate, 16 in the House, combination 460 years of service to the Commonwealth will evaporate. Bold and italics again, 460 years. I am forecasting well above 35 total retirements. Some members of the House are going to be going to the Senate and won't have their tenure broken. But I am forecasting that we will exceed 532 years of service to the Commonwealth, possibly reaching 600 years of experience that will not return in January. Let that sink in. With that comes all the knowledge, all the culture, all the traditions, all the relationships that the business community has depended on. And here's what happens when the elections are over. And I was a part of a very large class in 2002. We had, I think, 23 new members of the House alone with the election of Mark Warner and Tim Kaine in the 2001, the governor and lieutenant governor and Jerry Kilgore, attorney general. There were 21 new Republicans and two Democrats. It was a big change. This change, however, is monumental because we're not, we're not replacing just average Joes. Uh, we're replacing people who have served 30 and 40 years in the legislature. And the cultural traditional changes that occurred are um, inestimable at this point. And your job in the business community is to make as deep and constructive a relationship with your elected representatives as humanly possible. These people write the rules that govern your business. These people write the rules that govern your business. Imagine showing up <clears throat> and you're a major league player in baseball, football, basketball, take your sport. You show up one day to your, to your uh, field of venue or venue. The lines are completely changed. The dimensions are completely changed. The balls, the bats, the shoes, the, the goals, whatever, are completely changed. What do you do now? How do we win this game? And while politics is fun and interesting and it's got its own 
good and bad sides and it makes great copy, at the end of the day, these people draw the lines on your field of play. And if you don't know them and they have a question in committee or subcommittee and they don't call you, your voice will not be heard. Your business could suffer. Can you text your senator and delegate and or delegate and or congressman or a key staffer and have them text you back in five minutes? Do you have a relationship or do you not? This is the scared straight part of the program. I, I, I mean, Susan's known me for 22 years. I call it like I see it. Yeah. You know, I, the strike zone is, is only 17 inches wide and about 20 inches deep, tall rather. It's not that wide and it's not that deep. It is what it is. And, and I was talking to Fred before we got on. I said, how's business? It's either good or it's not. You're either making, the, and you know the business, you're either making a sale or you're not. You're either closing the deal or you're not. You're either, you're either covering uh, your expenses or you're not. It's the same thing in politics. You know, it is what it is. You know, there's, there's, there's excuses and then, and then there's successes, right? It's just business. We were in business. My family did business for, you know, gosh, we were, whew. 50 years, 40, 45 years in the bottled water business. You know, either, either the checks came in every day to, uh, to pay, for the, pay for the employees and the health care and the trucks and the gasoline and the, the lights and everything, or it didn't. Bottom line, making payroll, right? It's not easy. Politics the same way. And these people are drawing the, the, uh, the lines that control your business. You know, and if, you, if they can call you and you can answer them and say, yeah, that's a good bill or a bad bill. You're probably late to the, uh, the conversation anyway. Okay. The, the, the General Assembly convenes in January and exits in hopefully February, middle of March. Okay. It is not a deliberative body when it is in the General Assembly session in Richmond. It's not. That's a decision making body. They just have, they, they vote 2,500 times in 60 days, do the math. There's not a lot of time for thinking. They either hit the button, yes or no, or pull a stop and say, we've got to slow this train down, or I'm going to call my friend Fred Smith, or Susanna Dana, or Lynn Grimsley, or Linda Good, or Ben Munson, Peggy Burke, and figure this thing out. Hopefully, your lobbyist will be well ahead of this, but her task is going to be getting to know up to 40 new members of the General Assembly in the committees of jurisdiction, trying to figure out what they're going to do. And these, for lack of a better term, idiots are going to be coming in there cold. Now, they're not unintelligent, but let's just call it ignorance, okay? And to call someone ignorant is not an insult. It's just a fact. They either know your issues and your business and, your, and you personally, or they do not. It's a lack of knowledge. Period. Okay. So Susan is going to have a huge task to get y'all in a place of at least neutrality with the new people of whom it's going to be 20%, 25% possibly, over 25%. I'm doing the math right. Maybe 20, 20. 30% 30 maybe of the new, of the new kids <laughs> will be brand new. They won't know. And it's going to be the brand new building <laughs> completely. And they're going to go, hey, here's a great idea, because all these interest groups have just paid for their campaigns who use Virginia as a, basically a lab rat for policy and politics, and you get to play the victim. Is that fair, Susan? Am I drawing a, am I drawing I, a fairly bleak reality for them? <laughs> I, I, my stomach's been in knots since seven. <laughs> about this last what we're about to go into. I can say the word, which it's going to be just a cluster. Well, it's going to be a challenge. And the challenge is you get to go into um, a new season of educating people about your industry and what it does and why it's important. It's very, and it's really healthy for you, yourself and your organization to refresh that information, to remember why you do what you do to remember why this organization exists in the first place, to remember why you pay your dues to this organization, because it's really important. 
because people out there are not acting in your, in your best interest. And, you know, uh, that's just the nature of politics. And I, first of all, can you all understand me? Is it still breaking up? It's better now. Okay, I'm not sure what the issue was. They, they have been doing some line work and they're laying new, I think new um, cable and infrastructure here in the neighborhood. So that may have some, so I apologize. No, but I, I intend really beginning about after the primaries and that's something else that I want you to touch on Chris because the intra party marries the Republicans running against Republicans and the Democrats running against Democrats are going to be um, forth telling of what that's the numbers great. will be. Um, but beginning after that prime, say July, I will likely be all over Virginia up until and after the elections to start meeting all of the, the winners of the primaries and start to dig in deep to develop those relationships because 40 potential new members has never happened in my five years of doing this. And it is, it just is unsettling. I mean, it just, time is not going to be on our side, um, but we'll have to make it happen. So yep. well, this you is, are this is absolutely right. This is a generational shift and we can start jumping into the specific races. If you want to, if you have one, put them in the chat box. I'm more than happy to, I, I, I analyze most of them, but two critical components, two critical things when we look at both parties. The, the Democratic Party is going to have a, a very robust conversation primarily in Northern Virginia and to a lesser extent in uh, Hampton Roads with their uh, Senate district, their Senate races, their um, open seats. The, uh, the turnover is creating new candidates who are coming up. So we'll see the direction of the Democratic Party in Virginia. The Democratic Party in Virginia, um, is more moderate than the national, but that is changing. And we'll see how that plays out in Northern Virginia races to, re to re replace retiring uh, Senators uh, Saslaw and Howell. Howell's pretty much determined, uh, but, there other, but there are other challenges. There are a number of primaries against incumbent legislators like uh, Chad Peterson, Dave Marsden, George Barker, Adam Eben, and, uh, and the like. And then you have uh, the, the key matchups in, uh, in one in Charlottesville, uh, Sally Hudson and Creed Deeds, and then, uh, and then uh, some others in the, in the Democratic Party in the House, a lot of House. So they're having their own internal conversation. The Republicans, uh, likewise, are having theirs, but theirs is going to be less robust. They are uh, trying to hold the House and the Senate positions that they currently have. And for the most part, the House uh, legislators that were lumped in with other House uh, Republicans on Republicans, they've worked out their differences. And that's why you're seeing a number of these retirements as well. Um, so it's a less robust conversation internally, at least ideologically. Some of it's more personality driven. But at the end of the day, the Democrats are having the more, uh, more uh, telling ideological conversation. Susan? Yeah, I just want to understand um, what you said, Chris, the Virginia delegation. So since last Thursday, I've had conversations with Senator and Senator Chap Peterson and Senator Jeremy McPike, all of whom, when they were first, the business community, including real estate and housing, was kind of like, oh my God, like they're going to not fit into the pro business tent. And they are all being challenged by very progressive challenger. Um, Senator Dave Marsden said to me last, his entire caucus, so the Senate Democratic Caucus, is just going to change dramatically. He said to me, Susan, you go out and you get to know everybody you can, but if we who are facing primary challengers defeated, I can assure you that my challenger won't let you in the door because they don't want to communicate with lobbyists. And if you look at a, a dramatic turn, even if the Dems, the Senate Dems hold the majority, if the newer members of the Democratic caucus simply are so anti-business and so Yeah, I think she's frozen there. So, so, so what, 
Susan's talking about is the uh, dramatic shift that I was alluding to in the, the Democratic Party. And they're, they're not going to see lobbyists and they don't understand the role, the healthy role that lobbyists play and just uh, how many lobbyists everyone has in the Commonwealth or in, uh, nationally. I mean, you have right now three or four paid lobbyists in Richmond and Washington that are acting on your behalf and uh, you don't even know it. And th so they're, they're, coming, they're coming in with the national view of, um, of, of, the, of their party. And again, I, I, um, I um, you know, threw a, threw a marker in the game that they're not, the D Democrats in Virginia aren't that wild-eyed liberal progressive yet. They could be, but, you know, with the, uh, the predominance of the, the, the relationship with the federal government, it tends to uh, tone down the enthusiasm for um, some of these leftist policies. But there's, but, but they're going to, even the incumbents are going to want to keep them at bay and give them uh, some nuggets to, to try to, try to uh, you know, keep them, keep them fed. But it, it won't work. It never does in politics. And uh, we see the march of time. And this is parts of the march of time is this generational change from the baby boomers to the, to the Gen Xers. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm going to step in and try again, hopefully, better. I apologize, you guys, for why I'm going in and out. Is that a little bit more audible? That's fine. The other observation I wanted to make was let's just look at the delegation here in the Williamsburg area. So we have, and, and this holds until January 10th when the elected members of the House and Senate are sworn in. So our current delegation includes Senator Tommy Norman, although he has announced retirement, but that's not effective until January. Delegate Mike Mullen, Delegate Amanda Batten, and Senator Monty Mason. So Senator Norman has announced his retirement. Delegate Mullen, before his tragedy in his family, announced his retirement before session ended. Susan is in the political fight of his life because his district, again, all new districts, boundaries, all new people, Senator Mason's district, as now defined, plus six in the, in the Republican column. So he's going to have to work extremely hard for that reelection. So let's play devil's advocate. The entire delegation of the Williamsburg area could end up with one person who we all know and are familiar with, and that would be, I mean, it could happen. So that just shows you how important all of this is, the amount of work that's going to have to go into building these relationships that we've been blessed to have. And now we've kind of got a new slate and it's it's going to be a Herculean effort. Who, who are they getting? Monty Mason, Tommy, Amanda, and who else? Mike Mullen. Yeah, he's gone. Uh, holding this, holding the Senate, holding uh, Mason, holding that seat is going to be very, very difficult. Yeah, it is. Very difficult. Um, Danny Diggs, uh, I would probably put this a slight lean in his direction at this point. And uh, Amanda looks pretty good right now. But again, much, much of the outcome is going to be determined by the national narrative. If Donald Trump is the almost presumptive nominee for the Republican Party by midsummer, end of summer. It's going to be a very, very difficult season for Republicans to hold the House and the Senate. Um, and that's, that's just, it's almost out, outside of their control, much like it was in 2017, because the swing districts where, where Trump has lost so much uh, of the Republican uh, support or the independent support enough to, to tip the balance in these, in these new districts. And what's also important to understand about these new districts is they are largely permanent. Whereas before we'd have a 10 year change of the, of the landscape if the legislators drew the map, uh, these, these districts are pretty well locked in. And you'll see precinct level changes in, the, in 31 and in 41, but in, this is it. So these elections are really important. They're gonna set the ground game. They're gonna reset Virginia politics for the next 50 years. Without a doubt. So that's two generations of um, behavior. And I do think we'll see more retirements coming. I mean, again, we've got party squabbles, even down in Hampton Roads. Um, we have the president pro tem, Louise Lucas Pratt, who's being challenged by longtime Democratic Senator Lionel Spruill. Well, one 
going to lose. So there's another member of the Senate who's going to be gone. Um, it, it's just, it is boggling to think about all of this. And I think this is why what we do in building those relationships is what everything that do, whether it's it's housing sales or lobbying, it's all grounded in relationship. Yep. Yep. Do you have any specific questions you would like to? I was just going to ask if we have some questions at this point and lead for um, topic discussions um, before we we you know end about one. But I think this is. This is Bellwether, you guys. And remember, our governor has already expressed interest as well for president. So there are all these different tentacles that are coming into this bigger fabric that's being literally as we speak. Yep. Do we have any questions? Chris? Yeah. I'm not seeing any. So. Let's look maybe, Chris, at that last point of Ken has expressed interest okay. in running for president. Where yeah. do you see, you know, it, we're, we're, we're living that nomination fight looking ahead of us in the not too distant future. So how does that come into play here? Well, um, in, in Virginia's calendar is unkind to um, sitting governors with presidential aspirations. You're, in Virginia, you are elected for one four-year term, and Virginians, including new ones, learn very quickly that you're here for four years and that's it, and we don't understand why you would want to pursue another job. Um, it's a little unfair uh, for that construct to be put on the governor because, as we all know, uh, the president runs for re-election as the president. So it's not like you can't do the job, both jobs at the same time. Okay, it's, it's, it's possible, it's not easy, but typically what happens is they hire to fill in those gaps and it's not, and Glenn Youngkin certainly is of the capability of being able to be governor and hire up a political team that can get a lot of things to get done. But by and large, it's not, it's not easy just because he's in a midterm election for his only midterm and his success nationally will seem, well, how well did you do in Virginia? Well, He's in the middle of an election that won't conclude until November. You know, most of the ballot access process begins in September in a lot of the early primary states. So you have to decide which, which, one, you're gonna, which one you're gonna pick. And I have a, a saying in any political race about people who are being uh, bandied about for, the, for political office, and it's, and it's this, unless they say no, they're in, okay? Because the reality is, until they say no, they are, even if they're being speculated, and even this never even crossed their mind, and they haven't done literally a thing to, to pursue it, the calculus inside all the political decision making is that they are, they are running, and it, it's just reality. Um, so if he, is, if he is doing polling, and if he is um, having focus groups conducted, technically, he is actively pursuing the possibility of running for president. So until he says no, he's in. And whether he's all in and move, starts moving chips around on the game and spending money, a different consideration. But it factors into all the other elections because it always comes up. And it's a distraction. It's not You can't be on message for what you're trying to do as governor because people are going to start talking about being in for president. And that's why Ron DeSantis didn't say a thing about it until after his election. It's, al it's almost an impossibility from a political standpoint to be effect effective at both. Can you do both? The question is sure, but how effective are you going to be if you, if you have to do both at the same time? Uh, we're, we're, you know, if we're on a different uh, calendar, would it be more um, beneficial to him? Of course, but one of the reasons why Yunkin and Sears and Miares were was such an important election in 2021 because there was basically no other election in the country. So all eyes were on Virginia because we are a bellwether because we do this every year. And, you know, the calculus always changes in this respect. And that's just the nature of the beast. So, you know, I talk to their team all the time, his team all the time, you know, very close with the Lieutenant Governor's operation. You know, there's stuff I would never share here, but, you know, things are constantly moving in politics and that's not, that's not, uh, that's not saying much. 
I'm not giving away anything there. Here, here are a couple of questions, Chris. If okay. you were a incumbent, or let's just say it doesn't have to be an incumbent. If if you were a Republican running for the general, what would your messaging be? And conversely, if you were a Democrat running for the General Assembly, what would your message be? For running for the General Assembly this year? Mm -hmm. For the well, 2023 election. Well, 80, 85 to 90 percent of the General Assembly elections will be determined by June 20th. Let that sink in. So most people who are running, a vast majority of people who are running for the General Assembly are not making their case to the general population. They are making their case for election to the base of their party. And the base of their party is focused on primarily national issues. Um, now, some of the uh, incumbents will want to talk about more local issues. Depends upon their polling. But for the most part, this election will be determined by two very different views of the world, two very different constructs. Democrats are probably, regardless of where they are, I mean, you have some localization of it, but for the, for the Democrats, it's gonna be more on abortion rights, climate change, um, LGBTQ rights, um, being against Donald Trump. Um, those, are the, those are the big ones. If you look at the polling, what, what issues are important to them? Those are the big ones. And that's what, that's what they're gonna come into the General Assembly with. So from June 20th to January 11th or whatever it's gonna be next year, they're not gonna be focusing on issues that are important to the general public. They're gonna be focusing on delivering for the people who elected them, the base of their party. Republicans on the other hand, will be focusing on crime, education, parental rights, and uh, trying not to talk about Donald Trump. That's just nope, pretty you're, much- the you're, nature you're, of you're, you're right. And so again, for the, maybe the benefit of everybody, so when, we, when we're talking about the in June, and we're talking about uh, you know, people running against the same political party, and there are two ways that that nominee narrowed from the pool of, of candidate person. It's either a election or a primary. And in some places, it will the the local party has determined there will be an and in other places there will be primary, as in going to the polls and casting your vote. So could you a little bit, Chris, the difference between the two and why it's important for some incumbents to have a, an actual primary and other incumbents to actually be benefiting from a convention format? Yeah, the, the different uh, nominating methods are drawn up to favor the, the, the people who are in charge of the process. It lends them power. Uh, primaries tend to give up more power to the individuals in the local committees than um, the, the people who vote generally. So they're trying to shape the rules of the event. And Repo Republicans have been more inclined to go to conventions, generally speaking, than Democrats. I mean, Democrats don't do conventions hardly at all. Um, it's a complicated, it, it's an annoying process. It keeps a lot of people, it's exclusionary. It's meant to keep people away. So the more extreme elements who are uh, more than likely to withstand the pain and suffering of multiple round of balloting in a convention uh, one day is, um, you know, it's to those who are the most faithful, the most uh, committed to the, to the issues that are, that are driving the Republican Party at that time. Um, it's, 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 it's not as useful from an organizing perspective. The Republicans use ranked choice voting in an unassembled convention in 2021 very effectively. I think it saved the Republican Party of Virginia, frankly. Could you explain ranked choice? Well, ranked choice voting is a process by which you uh, vote for the candidates on the ballot, but you rank them in order of preference. And as a result, the, the ones that in the first round of balloting, those with the, with the fewest votes, they drop off, but their, their other votes are reallocated based on where they rank them to the, uh, to the other candidates. And after a series of balloting, 
you, you come up with a majority. It's, it's designed to get to a majority winner versus a plurality winner. And that's, that's, I think that's important in governing to have a winner with a majority of the vote. I just, I just, I just think that's an important part of the, the democratic process. Yes, Cindy. I was just curious, Chris, um, since a lot of those on the call today are, are obviously involved in housing issues, is there anything on either party, Democrat or Republican, are both of them in tune to the housing issues the same? Do you find that one party leans more into um, trying to resolve some of the housing issues we have in Virginia, some of the affordable housing? I mean, is there any kind of statistics on that? Yeah, polling is going to be limited, and if it is, it's going to be localized. You know, you have where you have problems with uh, housing. You know, in the suburban areas, we just can't find we can't find affordable house to buy, and if it is, it's usually, <laughs> honestly, not worth the price that people are paying. Um, it, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. But you know, politics is driven by what what people want, and, and people have an opinion on these things. But it doesn't affect broadly enough of the electorate to be an issue. Now, with polling and modeling, you can get and find those voters who are driven by housing to get them to show up. But it's, but it's a heck of a lift, and it costs a lot of money to find them. And you can find them. Every, every person on this screen, I guarantee you, has between seven and 10,000 data points that the political parties know about you, OK? Now, assembling those data points to the point at which are gonna, they're going to find language to motivate you to do something is, 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 is very intense and very difficult. That said, housing is, is, is one of those issues where you want to be able to talk about it. Say, yeah, we need to do something about housing. We need to increase our inventory. Uh, and, you know, Young has done, I think, some credible things there. Uh, but it's not going to be the attention. Game. It's not going to be, oh, oh that's, that's the big one, right? Because election swing with independents and independents vote on one issue per cycle. They have one, they don't pay attention to politics. They show up and say, I'm here to vote for X and not X, Y, and Z, X and maybe Y, but definitely not X, Y, and Z. So you got one shot. And if housing is the big issue, it's gonna to have to be driven by people within the industry to make it an issue because it's just not, it doesn't, it's not a much as, it's not, as adverse of an impact on a daily basis to everyone versus last year or year before in 21, you saw the, the, the spike in gasoline prices. That just hits everybody. And you're reminded of it every time you pass a gas station, you see the price, you know, 450 a gallon. You're like, what the hell is going on here? You know, for the most part, uh, the, 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 the cap on movement in the housing market is that people like myself have a pretty good rate. And we don't, we don't uh, have an inclination to go find one and move from a 2% rate to a 7% rate and start financing even with the equity we have built up, right? So it's not going to be like, oh, I can't wait to go buy another house. And that's keeping things down. Translating that to like, you know, a three-word bumper sticker ain't going to happen. As important as it is, this is one of those issues that you have to be able to, with the relationships that Susan has, and explain to them, this is what's happening. This is why it's happening. This is how we solve it. This is a nonpartisan issue. We need help. Don't make it a partisan issue and things will get better. In urban and suburban, inner suburban areas, you can, you can obviously see what's happening. They are intensifying the, um, the density of, of housing units. Uh, apartments are shrinking. Um, I have my own personal political philosophy that, that drive me crazy when I, when I see these things, but it is what it is. And then you have... Uh, uh, outer suburban, ex-urban areas that are trying to control growth, smart growth, uh, which turned out to be stupid uh, back 20 years ago when everyone was talking about uh, smart growth, um, you know, and, you know, and we're, you know, th these, 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 uh, these roosters are coming home. So chickens are coming home to roost, rather. Um, you know, and then, you know, some of them don't want any growth at all. And like Loudoun County says, anything west of Route 15 is, is cordoned off. Why? I have no idea. It just is. <laughs> they, don't, they don't want to upset the really rich people in Loudoun County uh, and force all the development next to uh, Dulles Airport and Ashburn and Leesburg. And it says localized issues, but <clears throat> until you're organized and have a single message, it's very difficult to have that absorbed by the, elect by the, um, the electorate and then their representatives. Remember, the, the elected representatives are, by definition, elected to represent other people. 
we always like to say that um, housing is politically, and I think you alluded to it, Chris, it just, do the narratives of both Republicans and Democrats have to find the stick about it that's going to enable them to talk about it in a meaningful and purposeful and solutions driven. So when it comes to any of the open seat, just for the benefit of the members, we do have a very active public policy committee, as you all know, and we always interview and make recommendations to our board of directors for endorsements and candidates for local elections. When it comes to our state elections, the General Assembly in particular, if there's an open seat, and for example, we've got two retirements now, right? We, we get Mullen is, cannot, is, is not going to return. That's a new district. Same with Senator, new district, new potential legislator coming into both. So we really interview for both and invite Martin Johnson, Mary Lawson, and they're down to participate. But our, our job will only be to generate the information. The our trustees will actually make the decision. We are allowed input we don't have the final decision. And in seats where there is an incumbent, for example, Hutton, she has been such a realtor champion. We already know that we're going to support her without a doubt. And our pack of Virginia trustees will be making those decisions at the end of April. I think it was um, Lynn who sent me a message and, and asked, Monty Mason has been a really strong friend to the realtors. Absolutely. Monty Mason has been carrier. He patroned legislation again for us this year. Because of his known quantity to us, again, housing being agnostic, doesn't define any party. We just follow the realtor champions who follow us. Monty Mason, I'm sure, is supported by RPAC of Virginia because he has proven his worth as, a, as an ongoing, repeated of our issues. There's a lot that we doing and a lot of ground that we cover, but much of those state endorsement issues will actually be made in Virginia with our, but the final decision will rest with the state, not with us. We'll just be allowed input. So call and procedures, um, little tidbit for everybody. Yeah. I think you need, I think defining issues more broadly so people can have an understanding of what the issue is. So when it comes up and it's in their mind, like. What is affordable housing? What does that mean? Because in my, in my family with two kids who are trying to find houses, it's not what everyone thinks affordable housing is. Um, when it comes to public policy, you know, you know, affordable housing for them is between 300 and 350,000 to buy a house. It's not publicly wow. subsidized income-based housing. Yeah, we're, we're seeing it could that. Be. <laughs> I mean, we're seeing that with our youngest son who lives up in Falls Church. And you know, for the price of Dave and me, once a week here at the exact Falls Church, Henry pays more for one than Dave and I pay for two. Bring it down to politics. Speaking yesterday with Jeremy, Senator Jeremy McPike from the sort of the in, in southern southern northern Virginia or into the Prince William area. He was telling me that in a conversation he had 3D Charlottesville area. The, I think he said it was the per minute cost in Charlottesville is 59 cents per minute. In Northern Virginia, it's 590. So when you look at the, the cost of campaigns, it's so dependent upon where the campaign is being held and the media market that's outlying that, that is what is going to drive the expense of these, these um, upcoming elections as well. Tell you guys, the gavel fell at 527 on February 27th, 30 seconds. I had 12 invitations to fundraisers. So, because they're not allowed to fundraise during, so those were ready to go. And it has been like nonstop fundraising at this point. So, yep. it's to go back into a special session because they can't fundraise. So, but they're going to be called back, I think. 
So we've got some time for Q and A. Um, I know I've got a couple, but I, if our members have any anything to pose to Chris, that from what I've found would be fascinating. But I'm a nerd in Disneyland, as Chris likes to say. So any, if not, I've got a couple. Go ahead. So again, in my conference, Jeremy, Senator McPike yesterday, yep. he reminded me that early voting starts in less than 48 days or 47 days. And that's for, I think for the general, right? For the primary. So, which, which for the most part is the general election for 85 the of the elections. So can you talk a little bit, Chris, about the concept or the, the um, this now of early voting and the huge. impact that's going to have? It's, it's, a, hu it's a huge development. It's, um, it's, the Democrats are frankly just better at politics than Republicans. Republicans have just seemingly run out of feet to shoot. Um, when it comes to doing things to keep up with the times and they're adjusting as quickly as they can to get their voters in the habit of voting absentee and early. Uh, the Democrats uh, figured out they broke the code on uh, checking the box on having an absentee ballot automatically sent to, the, to those voters. Those are typically lower propensity, lower, um, lower affinity voters on the affinity and propensity scales that they, that they watch very, very uh, closely both parties, and that's where the Democrats try to bank as many ballots as possible so they don't focus their time and attention to, to, to get them to the polls. So if, so if Linda Good and uh, Amy Kearney uh, vote early, they won't, they won't send, send you any more mail. So if you, if, I mean, the, the, the thing is, if you, if you wanna stop the mail train, if you wanna stop TV ads from hitting your screens or your, uh, uh, your inboxes, then vote early. And what, what a great concept that is, you know? Uh, it's, it's like unsubscribing, isn't it? Um, but the Democrats have gotten a lot better at uh, getting their people um, in the habit of doing so. And, you know, we're a, we're a habit-based people and we uh, Republicans are gonna try to catch up. Uh, for them, it's, it's better that they have fewer races this year to do that with, but, you know, they, this, is, this is another example of chickens coming home to roost when people are saying, oh, we should only vote on election day, you know, election integrity, whatnot, whatnot. Uh, doesn't work out too good when the other team is, is, is flat out kicking your tail up and down the field. So, um, that's a, a, yeah, and, and I don't see the time frame changing unless Republicans take over the House, Senate, and the governor's mansion and get it to what I would be I think is a more reasonable uh, approach to, to early voting to two weeks. I, I think that's plenty of time. I think uh, 48, 45 days is, is, is just, it's unmanageable. It's too expensive for the local registrars. And um, it, it also it creates problems if something were to break, if something happens, you know, along the way, you have an October surprise and you go, damn it, I've already, I already voted for that person. And it turns out blankety, blankety, blank. And you're like, whoops. <laughs> well, you know. So if, and this might be, I don't know this might be an easy question. I, I, maybe oh, I'll ask it hard, easy, or otherwise. So, if the elections were held today, mm -hmm. say the House would look like, and what would you say the Senate would look like? Uh, today, I would say, based on the polling that I know in the districts, twenty-one nineteen. Democrats win the Senate and no change in the House. Oh, okay. And in November, elections are in November. I well, know we've got October. <laughs> yeah. Good I know that one's a little bit harder. Be an October um, surprise. In November, I think the Democrats take back the House, and right now, I would say they get to they in the Senate they hold twenty two, maybe twenty three. And so, follow up: How is that going to impact governing when we have a Republican governor who will put in his own legislation? And if there are two Democrat Democrat controlled chambers, then we know that his legislation is going to be difficult to be passed. Also know that legislation that could come out of the House and Senate led by potentially Democrats in both chambers 
right. to the governor, well, then he has the power of vetoing. So, I mean, I mean you know, Glenn Youngkin will be having to choose between whether he wants to be Charlie Baker and uh, Phil Scott of Vermont and Larry Hogan and work in a bipartisan way and have a legacy built on that. Because if, if you want to get something done, you have to work with both of those uh, chambers and get something done. And that might jeopardize his national ambitions if he has any at that point. Um, if not, he's going to break out the veto pen and just, you know, maybe make a play for U.S. Senate in 28 when Mark Warner's up, or 26 yeah. when Mark Warner's up. So um, net net. Um, you know, it's going to be it's going to be difficult for Glenn Youngkin either way because it's going to be a very close majority in the Senate. It's also what what senators you can peel off, and the, and what committees you can get anything out of. I think the most one of the most important things the Senate needs to do to better represent and function as a Senate of Virginia is to go to proportional seating, as the House has. So based upon the, the seating is based upon what the Senate wants to do, as far as uh, partisan seating on on committees versus the House, which has in its rules that the, the committees are made up based on the number of Democrats and, and Republicans in the House. So if it's 50-50, it's 11-11 on the committees. Um, if it's 51-49, it's 12-10 on the, on the House committees. And, but the Senate, completely different. And, they, and a lot of the, uh, the, 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 the bills that you would think they would be contentious die in Senate committees because the, 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 the weight is towards one political party it can be nine to six or 10 to five or 12 to three based upon what the majority party wants to do and, and shaping legislation, which I think is, is wrong. Yeah, well, and for what it's worth, um, and I don't think this is going to change because I do agree with you, Chris, that the Dems to hang on to the Senate, whether it's 2119 or 2218, the current chairwoman of the House Senate Rules Committee is Hampton Senator Mamie Locke. Um, who also co-chairs the Housing Commission, a great relationship with Senator Locke. I mean, just rock solid. Right. So we you know, have the ability to speak to her about you know, being fair um, and, and working. That's always advantageous, but that's back to relationships. Um, I did want to note, I saw it was Terry Forrest um, asked a question in the chat, first noting how insightful this time has been with you and then asking, so where do we go from here? Hey, where, where do we go from here? Freight Association typically is the bar, very influential. Um, typically the bar and um, lament. <laughs> it's the season for lament <laughs> and cleansing your sins. Um, works for me, works for me. <laughs> never fails. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, you can sign up for my free newsletter, and uh, I share a lot of um, other resources. I do a lot of polling analysis. I talk to a lot of pollsters and campaign consultants, not just in Virginia, but around the country uh, for my network of election nerds. And, you know, I, I think you know, Virginia Free is an excellent resource. Um, we're nonpartisan. I mean, everyone has their partisan leanings to a degree, but I try to call the balls and strikes as, as best as possible. Um, with, with the decline of the state press corps, it's very difficult to get good information on a consistent basis. And so I, I try to aggregate as much as I can to make it entertaining um, for the reader as well. And, um, you know, I just, I just think it's, it's what you should do as far as learning about the process and the candidates is, is start doing it. Is just becoming involved on a regular basis looking at it as a, a really important puzzle to figure out as, as a fascinating part of our society and learning more about it in a positive, constructive way, I would caution against being too partisan in the business community and sticking to the issues that matter to your business. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I don't know, Chris, if you're aware of this, but even up through the National Association of Realtors, you know, we talk about realtor party, because again, housing is so important and, and yet so agnostic politically we don't necessarily say we're supporting this candidate because of their political party and this one because they're a different political party. When we look at the breakdown or the makeup, I should say, of both the House and Senate in Virginia and the, the breakdown of how our endorsements typically fall nearly mirrors the makeup of the House and Senate. Mm -hmm. So 
right now, the based on what we in in the past two years, when the last election cycle, we have endorsed in the House about 51, 49, 52, 48, when it comes to the percentage of more Republicans being in the House than Democrats in the House. But in the Senate, it's the, the, the um, opposite. More senators who are Dems than not. So more of our RPEC dollars have gone to support the Senate than the House, or excuse me, than the Senate Republicans. And there are times, you guys, to be candid, that I, Mary Lawson, insert, you know, realtor lobbyist name, we're at, you all give more to this party than you do to the other. Well, here's the, we can show you, like, here's the proof of us following the makeup of the body. We, we don't subscribe to really the other we follow the champion and the champion follows mm -hmm. us as we've said mm -hmm. so um and, and back to terry about process and candidates like chris said just start and i think that's where the the can play a big role you know i will really begin to spend time once june season's behind us and a little bit even before i am out and about getting to know reinforcing relationships we already have from all over Virginia that benefits everybody. So it's the process where you all are engaged. It's the people where I'm significantly engaged. And we will do our best throughout the year. Cindy and I have done a lot of programming and planning, and we will that you all have, particularly locally, of what and who and where is everybody. That's what we'll play during all of it. Chris, you're always so interesting to listen to. You bring so much knowledge to the table, and, and it's always a delight to hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I appreciate that. It means a lot. Well, unfortunately, I think our time has come to an end. It's a little after one o'clock, and we promise to keep everybody to their hour. So thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, you can send a newsletter and message me through there as well, or through Susan, if you have any specific questions you might have. Um, you know, Susan's a, a very good member of Virginia Free, and we're colleagues on a project. So if you have any questions, just reach out and uh, be sure to be engaged with your trade association as much as possible, because uh, they need you as much as you need them. And you all work together for, for good things for the Commonwealth and yourself. So keep going. Keep doing what you do. Yay! Yay, Yay. Sacks. Always the best. We'll have Go you back. Estate. Go sales. Okay. That's right. We'll have to have you back and see if your prediction plays out. Good I was wrong. just going to say that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, all right, my friend, you're the best. Uh, I appreciate you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.